Thank you again. Um, this is Joanna Rico from KMJ Consulting. And on behalf of the I-95 Carter Coalition, we'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, which is on the why and how of setting up a state unmanned aircraft system program. We'll be hearing from both DelDOT and MassDOT today. The call-in number will be in the, um, in the chat box. All participants are in listen-only mode. If you have any questions, you may dial star zero to speak with an operator. You may also reach out to Justin Ferry from KMJ. His cell phone number is 484-557-7009 for any difficulties with the web or audio application. He can help you out. The webinar is being recorded, and all materials will be available to participants after the webinar. The I-95 Carter Coalition has a new YouTube channel, and once the recording is finalized, it will be posted to, uh, to their YouTube channel. Since everybody, all the participants in, are in listen-only mode, please ask your question through the chat box. If it's for a specific speaker, if you could direct it to that speaker, that would be great. And we'll either, depending on time, we'll answer questions will be answered verbally or through the chat box at the end of the presentation or at the end of the webinar. This time I'd like to welcome, and I'd like to, excuse me, introduce Jenna Reeder, and um, she's the Innovation Associate for the I-95 Carter Coalition. Jenna? Thank you. Thanks, Joanna. Um, good morning, and welcome to the Coalition's first drone webinar. Um, as Joanna mentioned, my name is Jenna Reeder. I joined the Coalition staff last fall as a program associate leading the innovation track. Um, and we're very excited to be bringing this topic to you today. We'd heard um, over the past many months, uh, years, that a lot of our members are um, are adding drone programs, they're, or they're building on their programs, or they're interested in figuring out how to get a drone program off the ground. Um, and I think this level of interest is really evident in the fact that we had 100 individuals register today for the webinar. Um, and as you can see on the screen, um, the agencies represented by, by these registrants um, are really um, quite varied, both by geography uh, along our whole corridor region, um, as well as across a lot of different um, sort of a multidisciplinary group, um, which, is, which is certainly reflective of the way these uh, UAS programs are, are functioning and forming in, in our different states. Um, so um, I think what you'll hear today are, are two uh, very different origin stories from Massachusetts and Delaware on their, their drone programs, how they got started, and sort of the process they went through. Um, but while there are certainly differences in, in, in the, the how these things got put together, um, I think you'll, be, you'll note that, that both states have really thought through all the elements of, of what a drone program is, everything from data to training to obviously the, the actual um, drones themselves, the aircraft themselves, um, and, and really exploring a lot of different applications um, for this technology. Um, Sorry, I didn't mean to quite go quite so go along to what yet, but we're going to um, start with a few polling questions um, to, to get some answers from, from you in the audience just to, to um, get a little sense of where you are um, with your own programs. Um, and then we'll hear from Dwayne Day from Delaware on his, on his program and what they've done in Delaware. Um, and then we'll get a chance to hear from Massachusetts. Um, we've got two great speakers. Um, and then hopefully we'll have some time for question and answer. And as Joanna said, Feel free to ask your questions along the way. If the speakers are able to kind of answer um, those questions in the chat box, we can do that. But then we will take some time to go back through and, um, and answer so that everyone can get answers to those questions at the end. So at this time, I will introduce our speakers. Um, First, we're going to have the opportunity to hear from Dwayne Day. He's presently the Homeland Security Planner with the Delaware Department of Transportation. He's been in this position since 2008. His primary responsibility is to ensure that DelDOT is prepared to respond and recover from any natural or man-made incidents that affect the day-to-day -day operations. As part of his duties, Dwayne created DelDOT's Unmanned Aerial System Program and is the program manager, chief pilot, and trainer. 
In addition, from 2015 to 2018, he was the chair of the state's Homeland Security Advisory Council subcommittee, subcommittee on, uh, on unmanned aerial vehicles and the chair for the Delaware Unmanned Aerial Systems Training and Certificate Steering Committee. Prior to assuming his position at DelDOT, he was with the Delaware Emergency Management Agency, where he was the Weapons of Mass Destruction Training Coordinator and the State Exercise Planner. Blaine is retired from the Air Force after 20 years of service. Um, after Dwayne's presentation, we will hear from Massachusetts, and um, first we'll have the opportunity to hear from Dr. Jeffrey DiCarlo. He's the MassDOT Aeronautics Division Administrator, tasked with providing statutory and regulatory oversight for all aviation matters in Massachusetts including safety, security, airport development, and UAS programs. He leads the Commonwealth UAS Integration Program, which is an industry, academia, and government collaborative focused on enabling UAS and counter UAS systems. Jeff has more than 30 years of aviation operations and consulting experience with the military, industry, academia, and government. Um, he's an experienced principal investigator. He led NASA-sponsored air traffic control and airport operations R&D, and he has supported aviation systems acquisition activities for the Department of Defense. He's a former U.S. Air Force and airline pilot with over 10,000 hours in fighter and commercial aircraft, and he's a graduate of Fighter Weapons School. Jeff retired from the military as a lieutenant colonel following nearly 25 years of USAF active duty, Air National Guard, and Reserve Service. He sits on the board of directors of the Northeast UAS Airspace Integration Research Alliance and the Association for Unmanned Vehicle Systems International New England, um, and also the National Association of State Aviation Officials. So welcome, Jeff. And then um, in addition, we have the opportunity here today from Scott Ubelhart. Um, he supports MassDOT Aeronautics as chief scientist of the drone program. where he lays out the strategy and planning to guide MassDOT as it adopts drones and drives drones innovation across the Commonwealth. Prior to this, he worked in a technology startup and was on the technical staff at MIT Lincoln Lab. He has, he has conducted systems analysis of U.S. space architectures for the Air Force, analyzing missions, requirements, and solutions to technical challenges, and provided recommendations to senior government decision makers. Dr. Ubelhart served as a postdoctoral associate with MIT's program in Science, Technology, and Society, where he established the Cross-Disciplinary Space, Policy, and Society Research Group, applied MIT technical expertise to human spaceflight policy, and briefed senior congressional and NASA leaders. Scott earned his degrees from the MIT Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics in the area of structural dynamic control. So please join me in welcoming them today. As you can tell, they have a vast array of experience uh, in this area. We're very excited. But before we get started on that, we are going to ask you three quick polling questions. So the polling questions should show up in a chat box on your screen. Um, and just take a uh, minute to answer each of them. So the first one is, what type of agency do you represent? And we've got some choices there. And we'll give it a couple minutes for everyone to answer. Okay. And then we can move to the next one. Dustin, can you move that one in? Uh, the next question is about um, how you'd classify your state drone program. Kind of what, what state are you in? Are you just getting started? Are you pretty mature? Doesn't have to be, um, it can be a, a general answer. Okay, thank you. And then our third question is um, about what you, um, what would help your agency take your program to, to the next level, whatever that next level might be? Um, what could you add to that that would help?
Okay, looks like everyone needs more staff, no surprise. All right, thank you for answering that. And with that, we will let Dwayne take it away. Thank you, Dwayne. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, Dwayne Day here from Delaware, actually uh, rainy Delaware today. But uh, just wanted to uh, kind of give you an overview of our program and how we got there and, uh, you know, hopefully where we're going from, from here on. Um, I'll just let you know that I do have, uh, right now I have nine FAA 107 pilots and 16 aircraft. So uh, this is how we got there. Um, basically, our section uh, does a lot of the special events here in the state also, and uh, we are working pumpkin chunking. Uh, yeah, it's, it's in the, it's a redneck thing. Anyway, pumpkin chunking in 2014, uh, I was sitting, <coughs> excuse me, I was sitting in my truck uh, early morning waiting for the event to open and I saw this contraption flying around and uh, so I got out of my truck and walked over and I talked to the individual and um, he explained that this thing was a drone, a DJ Phantom 3 and he pulled out his phone and showed me we could do some downlink and I thought wow this this is really something that we could we as in Dell Dot could use to you know not only uh, take advantage of parking and special events but some other aspects so I brought it back to my boss, and uh, him being proactive said, yeah, I'll run with it. Uh, it wasn't that easy. We ran into some roadblocks, but uh, we eventually got there. Um, but as we moved on, uh, before we could actually develop our program, uh, and during my research, I noticed there were uh, a lot of things that uh, the bad guys could use these for, a lot of nefarious uses. Uh, and I sit on the uh, Homeland Security Advisory Council to our cabinet secretaries. And uh, so I presented a white paper to them, uh, some of the things that they could be used and what we can anticipate is going to happen uh, in the next couple of years. So as you can see up here, some of the security concerns we had, especially smuggling drugs across borders and into our prisons. Um, and being in the Homeland Security side, the chemical, biological, radiological uh, aspect of it. So um, if you've done some research, you've also seen that <coughs> people have put them, you know, firearms and other weapons, flamethrowers and guns and everything on them and um, used them for uh, other than what they were intended for. So I briefed the, the Homeland Security Advisory Council, and they decided to create a subcommittee on UAVs uh, that would brief the, the HSAC uh, as things progressed in the UAV world, and uh, I was also elected as a chairman. And that committee was made up of various agencies, you know, obviously the DOT, members from the fire school, Department of Ag, uh, University of Delaware, who was doing some uh, research uh, and development on UAVs, state police, uh, the aviation division, obviously the safety and homeland security, uh, individuals from our guard, um, we even brought in a private hobbyist because at that time it was pretty much new technology for us and uh, this individual was very versed in UA, or, uh, drones and flying them so he brought him in, we brought him in as our subject matter expert. As we progressed in the AIDSAC, uh we found out there was just so much and we were trying to basically look at everything, everything that had to do with drones and UASs. Uh, it was just too much for the committee, so we decided to split it up. Um, we created a UAV task force uh, that was just looking at economic development. How could we bring this technology into the state and take advantage of it? Uh, and then for those agencies that wanted to further uh, the use of UAV, UASs, uh, we developed a training and steering committee that would basically put everybody in one big pot and we learn to train together, fly together, and share our resources because Delaware being a small state, uh, there wasn't a lot of reach back for anybody. Um, and then the left the Homeland Security Advisor Council just to basically look at the nefarious use of UAS and how to, that technology of counter UAS.
So as we progress, the only committee that's really left is the UAS Training and Certification Steering Committee. Um, what we did is uh, we brought in UAS Academy out of Virginia, uh, Dr. Blanchard over there, and he came over and basically taught us how to fly, how to uh, do our FAA tests, how to uh, do some uh, special techniques as we were flying, and basically got everybody up to speed. And like I said before, we were all trained to the same level, and these are all the membership, all the folks that were in that initial committee. That committee's primary focus is on what we call MOST, which is maintenance, operations, safety, and training. And after each flight, after each training, we would sit down and we would discuss if we had any maintenance issues, if we have operations issues, any safety things and training. So basically everybody could learn from somebody else's mistake or some other issue. Um, basically what we basically came out of that was developing flight training standards. Um, and developing training pro programs that mirrored other agencies across the state. Uh, it also brought in this mission collaboration, uh, best practices, and the, the troubleshooting, as I mentioned before. And we were able to implement that shortly after the program uh, was up and running. We had a hostage takeover here in one of our prisons, and we flew as a team uh, six different agencies. We flew for 15 hours and 67 flights, basically doing overwatch for uh, the FBI and the SWAT teams. As I mentioned there earlier, the focus was that everybody would be trained to the same level. Uh, everybody flew DGI operating systems. Um, that way, if we could, or if we needed to interchange, we could exchange pilots. Uh, we have pilots from DEMA, state police, and uh, local agencies who will fly with them, who will fly with us. And we've actually even loaned out some of our, our drones over to DEMA during uh, some deployments they had. We grew so big, though, we almost had, uh, right now, I think there's 40 people in the state that have been trained through this committee. Um, so we have just a small core group right now of about 10 people uh, from the different agencies, basically the, the, the group that started the committee, and we've gone into more of a tactical operations flying. Uh, how can we put up four or five drones at the same time in the same uh, flight area? So we're always learning, we're, uh, developing different systems or different programs. Now, DelDOT, we've expanded. We are the largest program in the state. Uh, these are some of the aircraft that we have. The first one is the Inspire 1 Pro. Uh, that was our first aircraft. And uh, as each aircraft or each mission develops, we find that we might need a different type of aircraft. So you'll see later, like, a different tool in the toolbox. Um, but the Inspire 1 Pro, the uh, Mavic, to Enterprise on the right side of that, the Phantom 4 Pro. Um, in the middle, there's the um, M210 and the Mavic Air off to the right. First thing we had to do is we had to develop uh, what our operational policy was going to be. Uh, so we wrote an SOP, and we've actually uh, had to revise that just last year uh, as things developed and we learned new things. So. Uh, but basically, it's program oversight on uh, the operational directives, our division participation. Each division that wants to participate in the UAV program um, basically has to purchase their own drones, provide their own pilots. I basically just make sure that they're trained and following the FAA guidance. I also look at the equipment to make sure that we're all keeping standardized equipment. All the equipment purchases have to go through me. You know, like I said before, I, I'm responsible for making sure they're trained and they're certified. Uh, one thing we do require that the FA-107 doesn't, we do require a two-man approach. Uh, we always have a pilot and a visual observer. Uh, it's a good practice to be in, especially if you're going and have a, a COA or night flying. Typically, uh, your COA or, or waiver will require that you have a visual observer. Um, we also require that uh, 
any contractor or any Delta pilot has to contact the TMC in advance and identify where they're going to fly, what their aircraft, and contact information. Primarily, so if the public calls in, that uh, we can either identify that it was a Dot pilot or it was a hired contractor. Our pilot qualifications are, um, we have all our pilots, you know, get their 107, and I had them do it on their own. Uh, we used to hold classes where we would teach uh, 107, uh, not only for Dot but across the, the state. And the actual percentages of people going down to test were very low. Um, but the people that went and test, they, you know, most of them, probably 98% passed. So we figured out it was just uh, the motivation of the student uh, to go down and get their test. So we stopped teaching basic uh, 107 prep. And uh, we had those individuals do it on their own, uh, either through a private consultant firm or something else, or just studying online. Um, then once they get that training, they come to, uh, once they get their 107 certification, they'll come to me, and we'll put them through a two-day pilot qualification course. And this teaches basic man UAV maneuvers. Um, there are 10 maneuvers we, we have them go through. Uh, and what we'll do is we teach those maneuvers. I, they go back to wherever their division is and practice for about 30 to 60 days. Then they'll come back to me and I basically give them a check ride and sign off on their training records. We have a requirement uh, after they've been signed off that uh, all our pilots have to fly three flights in a 90-day period on the particular aircraft that they're, they're flying. As you saw earlier, I got five different aircraft. Uh, not all of them fly the, on the same aircraft. My breakdown on pilots. Like I said, I got nine. Uh, I have a district engineer, surveyor, and project manager from our maintenance and uh, operations division. The one gentleman's a commercial pilot. He basically uh, does all our uh, interfacing with the FAA. Uh, he'll get our, our COAs, any waivers, any, uh, and you'll see we have a few waivers. Um, I do have safety officer and a special events uh, manager. Uh, eventually, we're going to have all our safety officers officers uh, have drones. Um, I have one female. Uh, she's assistant director from finance. She basically transferred over from uh, maintenance and operation. Obviously myself, one of the supervisors here in the right-of-way. Um, as we speak, I am putting in six more individuals. Uh, they will start their training this month and I'll probably start with their um, actual hands-on uh, hopefully in May. Everybody has a training record. Uh, it's this binder it has, you know, I guess two two leaves in there, but it has all their all their uh, FAA uh, scores, their sheets. Um, it has their uh, certification checklist. It has an application that uh, require that not only that they apply for it, but their supervisors uh, have read the SOP and understand what their requirements are. Uh, any other special flying. Uh, we all my pilots are uh, qualified to fly at night, so we do have a flying quiz and uh, mandatory readings they have to do. And then in the back, they also have any training certificates that they might have done. <clears throat> this right here, I know it's hard, to, probably hard to read, but this is their qualification checklist. Um, it uh, the top it has some of the mandatory stuff uh, either. That was uh, some of it optional, some of it's mandatory. Uh, as far as a general exam, uh, if they're having tactical operations training or if they're doing some indoor flying. Um, but below that, you'll see all the required maneuvers. They do have to basically uh, know how to do a MOCA, um, accuracy land, some complex figure eights, do blind landings, basically builds that trust up with their VO. Some road closures course, uh, point of interest, waypoint flying reveals <clears throat> some long distance orientation and uh, be able to fly uh, ADDI mode. If anybody has a, a DJI, they'll understand what the ADDI mode is. It's basically taking off the GPS and uh, flying just uh, by the seat of your pants on that. We do have specialized training. Um, 
we have everybody on my team's been what we call tactical operations through UAS Academy. Where, like I said, we've learned to fly uh, together. Uh, we've all been trained on frequency allocations and adjustments. Uh, most of us have been through indoor flying. Uh, we've done some search and rescue and some night ops. Uh, they're all night qualified. And I just sent uh, eight of us through a uh, FLIR course and or level one thermography certified. Uh, we will be, four of us will be taking a, <coughs> excuse me, four of us will be taking a hazmat course um, through Magda International uh, to identify hazardous materials, cargo. And uh, we're also bringing in a night flying course through uh, SMG out of Nevada, uh, both in May. I try to send somebody to uh, a conference, um, whether it be AVUSI or the Public Safety Conference, Interdrone, uh, we've done the last couple of years. And we're, five of us are going to the AVUSI Exponential 2019. Um, basically just to keep up with the latest technology, what's out there, what courses are being developed, um, and just trying to keep the pulse on what the commercial side's doing. One of the things we're doing now is we're developing advanced training, um, and this is based off what the NFPA 2400 has just put out. That just got released, I believe it was in December or January. Uh, we're kind of copying a little bit of what they're doing as far as uh, building props. Uh, to test our pilots and their skill level. This is uh, one of the renderings uh, we've done, it's kind of what it'll look like, the basic course uh, where an individual will fly under, over, under, and hit a barricade wall and have to slide left. Go up a little bit, slide right, and then uh, look at this cluster of uh, stuff and identify what's in those clusters. And then fly on the back side where they will, the fans will be on and they'll have to do uh, high wind flying. And then uh, they'll come back and do a slalom course uh, and to finish. And those will be timed uh, as, they, as they progress and get used to the course. We'll be basing that on a, a timed uh, result. We do all our training uh, for the most part at the State Fire School. It's in Dover, Delaware. Uh, that's the official pro or official training site for um, the state UAS program. Now we do do some of the training, some of our trainings at our local Dell Dot yards, but primarily if we're going to hold a course and we're bringing somebody out of state in, we'll hold it here at the uh, the fire school. Uh, like I said, this is our inventory. Um, Inspire One Pros, we have four. The Phantom Four Pros, we have five. The Mavic Air, the Mavic Pros, and then uh, our latest is the Two Tens. Um, we we have three of those now, and we look at drones a different tool in a toolbox. You know, some of the like the Mavic Air, we fly within the trees, looking at watershed projects. You know, we never want to lose a drone, but if we're going to lose one, we want to lose that one to replace. It's about eight hundred dollars. Uh, versus the 210, which to replace that is about 6,000. So, um, like I said, we treat it as different tools in the toolbox. And these are the, our primary one, the Phantom 4 Pro. Uh, our survey crews will do a lot of uh, surveying, uh, drone deploy, doing 3D uh, mosaic uh, photogrammetry with it. Um, my section, uh, we do a lot of the uh, operational assessments. Uh, whether we're doing Firefly, NASCAR, or something like that. So we are going moving into the DJI M210 with the zoom cameras and also the thermal cameras. We do do a lot of uh, work for our local law enforcement agencies that aren't as advanced as us. So we've done some thermal cameras uh, looking for missing people uh, or just their special events. Um, so we have been hired out, basically. Uh, all our aircraft are FAA registered. Um, even though you can register them uh, by just going online and getting that 10, 11 digit number, uh, I require that all our aircraft are N numbered registered. Uh, these are the forms you have to fill out. Um, just wanted to be consistent and, you know, we are a public agency, so everything should be uh, registered under the public agency. 
insurance. Uh, we've had the round and round uh, with our insurance company or our coverage administrator, and uh, all state agencies are covered. Uh, state indemnification uh, rule, I guess, or law. So state agencies are covered. Um, the county public agencies, they had to get their own insurance policy. Most of them were looking at about a million dollar or two million dollar policy. Um, so one of the things we did have to apply and we all had to, is you know, our registration numbers, our pilot's license, and a copy of that training program. So a well-developed training program was beneficial for us when we could show them that you know we just didn't grab this thing out of the box. The FAA doesn't really care if you know how to fly. Uh, you have to go down and pass that test, but there's no actually operational flying requirement. Uh, so that basically wasn't good enough. So that's why we developed all these, all our training programs. One thing we did is we took an old paratransit bus, and we have a uh, we call drone bus. It has video downlink capability into the TMC, and all our aircraft do. We can download live feed into the TMC. Um, but we've learned from being out there, uh, some of the larger NASCAR, Firefly, the prison experience, we need to have a place where we can charge uh, our batteries, work on our drones, and uh, actually be able to uh, downlink the uh, pictures and the videos from it. So if you look in the back, the very back, there's a three monitors. That's a, um, a workstation It mimics uh, our software that we have in the TMC. Um, we have a, a station here with a toolbox underneath it and charging stations and a desk off to the side, uh, which we can do some planning. But we are capable of um, being mobilized. Uh, we can pretty much travel anywhere in the state or even uh, out of state uh, as far as uh, responding to any of our our neighboring states that need support. As you can see in the middle picture, I have a, uh, a generator uh, on the back. It's powered by generator. Uh, it's a 110 system, kind of like a household system, but I also have an inverter in there. We have FAA waivers. Uh, we first did our certificate of authorization, uh, which was kind of scary at the time because the FAA said, you know, how are you going to train your folks and, uh, you know, how are you going to maintain this program? And we just didn't have the manpower for it. I was the only one in the program at the time. So once they released Part 107, that took care of how we were going to uh, train our people and certify them. Uh, we, all our pilots are 107 certified. We do have waivers under that. Um, we have uh, waivers to fly at night under 107. We have uh, 107 waivers to fly in Class D airspace around Dover Air Force Base. And we have a certificate of authorization, a COA, to fly uh, Class D airspace around uh, Wilmington Airport and the Air Force Base. I keep track of all this and all my pilots. Uh, we just started using Drone Logbook in January. Seems to be a good program for us, but we got add up. I mean, all our all pilots are in there. Whenever they're done flying, they sync to the cloud and DGI, and it, it downloads in here. So I, I have all their flights. I can tell where they flew, how high they flew, the distance they flew, time. Obviously, uh, we can plan missions. We can document all that. Uh, I can do a maintenance program in here, which is a requirement from the FAA, and it. it it basically covers every gamut that we need. And then I can print out monthly reports uh, that whenever I meet with my pilots, which is about once every two months, we sit down and I'll print out a document and say, this is what you're flying. I can track how long they're flying and if they're uh, meeting their requirements. Basically funding for the courses when we start out the training, uh, we did a lot of our um, Training were through the Homeland Security Grant Program. It helped that I sat uh, on that program and basically knew uh, what was available. Uh, to the date, we probably spent over 80,000 training, uh, not only Delta pilots, but all the pilots throughout the state. Uh, a lot of our drones uh, are bought through state funds and special event funds um, in the STIC program. But 
the key is we tried to buy drones through the grant, Homeland Security Grant Program. Uh, ran into so much red tape that we just bought the drones by themselves, and a lot of the uh, sensors, the thermal cameras, the zoom cameras, we were allowed to buy those. We just couldn't buy the aircraft themselves, so we just kind of worked around that a little bit. As far as the drone bus goes, uh, through all our different uh, the maintenance shops and stuff, we we I would take it to a different shop and say, hey, you know, what can you do for me? And uh, they would work their magic on that. So a lot of kudos go out to uh, the maintenance folks in, uh, in our DELDOT program. Uh, video and photo processing. Uh, you know, when we first started flying, you know, you're up flying, you think, yeah, I, I'm the best, I'm the best pilot out here, and I can, you know, my pictures are going to be beautiful. And then we would we would take them and download them, and it almost make you sick sometimes the jerking movements and stuff. So we uh, we had in in house developed courses from some of our photo guys on uh, how to uh, actually take decent photos, and we learned not to do so many jerking. Uh, movements but uh, you know before I would turn and release them <laughs> we still process them through uh, Adobe Premiere 15 so I can cut and cut and paste and uh, maybe put some uh, uh, introductions or something on it so um, and then we're kind of limited through the state system on how many pictures you know we can actually send uh, kind of go down about three pictures because they're in 4k you know high def uh, and you can't send any videos so we learned that we need to do uh, Dropbox uh, flashcards. I've lost plenty of flash uh, my flash drives downloading a presentation or pictures and taking it over to somebody, and uh, they basically just they just don't make it back. Um, and if you don't do something of that nature, your IT folks are going to be really upset at the amount of uh, data is stored on on your uh, your servers and. Uh, so, you know, if you think about that if you're developing your program, you know, where are you going to store your, um, uh, where are you going to sort, store this data and how long are you going to keep it in your data retention policies? Uh, some of the uses for Dell Dot, uh, primarily in my section, uh, situational awareness. Like I said, we can take that feed and bring it into the TMC uh, where we have live feed and the cabinet secretary. And all the directors can be sitting in here uh, and making decisions and advising the public and obviously the other government agencies. Debris assessments, traffic mitigation. Uh, this last year we've done a lot of stockpile estimations. Uh, we want to get into bridge inspections. Um, you know, we're part of the pool fund study with uh, Indiana DOT and uh, Purdue. So hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see where that goes. Um, Getting ready to do Monday uh, archaeological inspection, a photo shoot. Uh, you know, so as before, middle and after, basically, and then some of our dune erosions uh, pre and post storm. Real quick, this is a uh, Royal Farms. Uh, our deputy attorney general wanted me to take some pictures of this uh, prior to this construction site going. They're a little bit concerned that we might end up in uh, court. So I did before me or before middle and after. Um, route 16 and uh, 1, you see this photo here, uh, and then this is the result of it. Uh, it was a rendering that, of what is going to be, uh, you know, what that, that website's going to, or that uh, road's going to look like in the future. Um, a Firefly Festival, we monitor how much traffic and flow of uh, vehicles go into this parking lot. It's a grass field. Uh, and these are all tent, camper, tent campers, so some of the other things we do with them. Um, this was in a rural part of Route 1. We had no cameras there, uh, so we uh, took pictures and we provided that live feed into the TMC. Where we're going with this, hopefully, uh, we're looking at tethered drones, and uh, we're also looking at unmanned uh, maritime drones for uh, bridge scouring. Uh, obviously, with uh, with the bridge, uh, you know, we're using thermal and stuff like that and trying to develop our, our operating procedures and processes uh, and actually looking at some what the other DOTs are doing across the nation, trying to piggyback off that. That, as far as my program, um, I think I am about five minutes over, so I apologize. No problem. Thank you so much, Dwayne.
Um, and with that, I think we can, we'll move right into uh, our MassDOT presentation and folks can continue asking questions in the chat box. So if you want to answer those um, while Mass is presenting or we can, um, we can touch those at the end. All right, sounds good. Thank you for the uh, excellent presentation, Dwayne. Really appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be invited uh, here to share a few highlights of our program. So just a, just a little perspective, you know, about what our organization uh, looks like. Um, you know, we're probably a bit different uh, than some of the DOTs. Um, our organization was constructed in, in 2009. We were originally at the Massachusetts Aeronautics Commission. Uh, when you look at the blue boxes there on the slide, the one that really probably stands out to everyone is this rail and transit division. And that's uh, one of the divisions that owns a bunch of rail across the state and has to do asset management for that rail and as well as the bus systems across the different regions of the state. Um, then we also, which is unique, we actually um, run the Massachusetts Bay Transit Authority, which runs the subway commuter rail and a bus system closer into Boston uh, with the commuter rail extending out as far as about, uh, you know, 60 miles or so away from Boston. As far as our team is concerned, you know, really feel uh, very fortunate to have a lot of valuable experience and expertise. And uh, we have folks from a lot of, you know, a lot of current and former experience with the military and the airlines, firefighters, uh, we work uh, a lot of parallel uh, research for everything we do with UMass and their research team through the UMass Transportation Center and their engineering department. We have the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative uh, uh, represented, startups, industry experience for our team members. These are core team members. Data scientists from a, kind of a unique uh, organization, the Massachusetts Green High Performance Computing Center. It's a supercomputing site uh, that all the big uh, universities in the state actually participate in. Uh, folks from MIT, EMTs, and then of course some of our core organization at DOT actually does double duty. Our statement of purpose, we're building a strong foundation that can scale. That's our, that's our focus. And then we really want to innovate uh, incentivize near uh, COT systems that are quick to the street. So we want to get involved in some research and development, but only if we can very quickly translate that technology to something we can use operationally, including counter UAS systems. So what we're going to talk about, we thought that it might work if we actually describe how we're developing our comprehensive drone program, discuss our efforts with incident response and emergency management, and then convey how we are promoting innovation. Uh, I'll hand it over now to Dr. Scott Eubelhardt, our drone program chief scientist, and he'll speak about how we're developing a comprehensive drone program. Thank you so much, Jeff. It's a real pleasure to be here today. So as Jeff mentioned, our real focus from the very beginning has been to figure out how to kind of develop a scalable program to really meet expanding needs. You know, really kind of assuming very early on that the entire drone industry would grow very large and we want to make sure that we were kind of prepared to kind of deal with that level of growth. And also real strong focus on understanding what is the value of drones and how do we best take the images and you know, video that a drone is taking and really turn it into actionable information that people can really use in order to kind of ultimately make decisions. So one of the kind of key themes of, you know, that we've been considering from the very beginning is comprehensiveness. How do we make sure that we do have this very comprehensive program that can grow? Partly that's, you know, making sure that we, uh, you know, understand flight operations and have the checklist necessary to kind of fly safely, and I'll talk briefly about this. Partly it's making sure we have the policies and procedures that are in place. In particular, we have a very strong focus on privacy, one of the key commitments that has really kind of come down from us, you know, from the uh, Secretary of Transportation that we really kind of hold dear. And along with all these others, though, really kind of all the other, uh, make sure we're dealing with all the other aspects that are really required to kind of have that broad, scalable program, from training and evaluation for both the operators and examiners, uh, organizational models for how we actually kind of get drone resources uh, 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 in the air, business processes, the flight operations, 
data analysis, management, security. I'll talk about this a little bit. And also integration into existing MassDOT and MBTA processes. Again, recognizing that you know, all the rest aren't really valuable unless you can actually kind of turn what you're creating into real actionable information. So I'm really going to be spending a little bit of time talking about organizational models and kind of data analysis and security. And I'm really going to begin by really talking about how we kind of derive initially the organizational models, uh, derive the approach based on the use cases, based on the missions that we anticipated flying. And really to kind of begin thinking about this, really started by imagining how we would classify those use cases, how we would classify those various missions. You came up with a very sim you know, simple sort of framework, imagining the frequency of missions kind of on the x-axis, the complexity of missions, very qualitative assessment based on any number of various uh, aspects. You know, but you can imagine how within this kind of trade space, you can be operate on the upper left where you have very complex operations that happen very rarely. For example, that you need to do for emergencies or natural disasters. Or maybe in the lower, uh, the lower right, you know, very simple sort of missions that they're going to need to fly all the time. Once we kind of had this framework in place, then the next step was really to talk to lots of people across all of MassDOT and the MBTA to get a sense for what sort of drone missions were out there. And begin to then map some of those into this framework. And this is only a small subset of the missions that we heard about, but kind of give you a sense that a lot of the missions we're looking at kind of, you know, span the space from kind of the upper left to the lower right of this trade space. Now, we initially, you really decided to kind of focus on a couple of missions uh, specifically, spanning that space from disaster and incident response in the upper left, uh, airport pavement evaluation, kind of in the center, and construction site monitoring in the lower right. And thinking about it this way, it really led to several organizational approaches that we could begin to try out, begin to pilot and test to see how to get those drone resources. For example, for the incident response, we really kind of imagined that you would need those more qualified operators with experience in first, as first responders, experience in aviation, to help deal with those more complex challenges. This is going to be, we imagine, a centralized approach, and that centralized drone wing really uh, the core of our pilots working directly under aeronautics. We certainly can imagine a role for vendors, you know, really kind of hiring vendors to kind of regularly and routinely inspect you know, all the airports across the Commonwealth, for example, making sure that the vendors are also tracking the and following the exact same rules that our MASA and MBTA uh, employees must. And in a, in a distributed approach for those more, for the simpler sort of missions, where it can really kind of train kind of a larger cadre of operators, to kind of fly, kind of take pictures of, for example, construction site monitoring. Now, in, in the end, we probably have flown far more what you may call centralized missions with kind of that centralized drone team. The actual missions that we've flown are much broader than we see here. But this was at least kind of the initial way we began to kind of think about how we want to grow this and how we want to kind of structure this. Now, once we had this in place, of course, you know, uh, uh, very similar to everything that uh, Dell Dot described. You know, needed a policy in place to really kind of describe how we were going to be, again, you know, working with drones and how we're going to make commitments to things like, you know, uh, personal privacy, safety. That leads, of course, to kind of operating procedures, how we're kind of tracking, you know, logging flights, and ultimately to kind of flight checklists. Everything from, you know, making sure the operators are current for that particular aircraft to emergency procedures that they could have you know, in case you have a flyaway, for example. Another key theme you know, that we really want to uh, underline is how we want to really vet everything we're doing, kind of have a constant feedback loop through regular flight operations. You know, we really want to make sure that we are flying early and flying often and learning all the time from what we're doing and feeding back those experiences to update these checklists and these procedures and these policies and really the entire program. Uh, through the procedures, we also have uh, power processes in place, very much based on kind of a lot of the aviation heritage that, you know, uh, comes throughout our team for both mission planning and flight readiness reviews, a process for how do we receive and evaluate brand new requests and determine whether or not we want to accept a new mission, uh, for evaluating requests, for planning flight operations, 
and kind of a thorough flight readiness review process for every single mission we fly, where the remote pilot command will describe the objectives, uh, uh, assets required, the site description, flight operations, hazards, and so on. Of course, lastly, kind of that focus on how we're going to both deliver the data to the uh, end users and kind of write it up in after action reports. Now with this, let me also kind of talk a little bit more about actually the data. Because one thing we also appreciated from the very beginning of this entire program was that data is really the absolute key to everything we're doing here. To some extent, you know, the, you know, a successful program, you know, is only partially kind of, you know, uh, created by that drone flight, that very kind of quick and fast drone flight itself. Really, it's understanding how you're working with data from before the flight all the way through kind of the end that really is the metric by which we evaluate mission success. And so we kind of put together a very general process for what we've kind of termed our data pilot to think through this larger problem. Think about planning for the missions, you know, collecting the missions, the actual you know, part where you have the aircraft, you know, in, in the air. Processing the data once it's on the ground. Storing it, again, storing these very large amounts of data, uh, images, and video. Analyzing them, disseminating them to end users and also accessing the data long term. And this is actually an important point I also want to underline. We kind of you know, appreciate that you know, it's fantastic to take images of a highway, of a bridge, or something like that on any one day, but we really see the long term value in what we're doing in how do you kind of take that data of, 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 a, you know, of an asset, not only one day, but over many days, and over many years, and ultimately, pull out, you know, uh, you know, what happens over those assets using change detection techniques. And ultimately bring advanced algorithms so you can begin to talk about predictive maintenance over a period of time. So again, it's really kind of critical then that you have access to that data over a long period of time and be able to correlate it, you know, for the one, you know, asset that you're looking at and for those multiple assets across the entire state. And so we're really kind of focused on really kind of building a large team to help enable this overall process. You know, uh, same thing. We're really kind of learning also with data from our flights and operations and feeding back. So this, this current year, we really are beginning to expand the overall uh, data pilot. We're looking at, for example, the data repository. You know, again, you're talking about, you know, any individual image could be on the order of 4 to 10 megabytes. Those images could be brought together as a large ortho mosaic file, which could be anywhere upwards of 100 megabytes. Videos could be as large or as long as the video is. So it's very easy within a single flight to capture many gigabytes of data. And when you imagine how many flights you could have, that really just begins to expand. So really thinking about the data repository, how do you store, how do you secure, how do you index and find uh, uh, the data is absolutely critical. And again, this is where we are very fortunate to be working with the supercomputing facility, the Massachusetts Green High Performance Computing Center, that has really set up a node for us to begin to kind of develop a lot of these data repository uh, approaches and techniques within a very secure facility that allows us to kind of grow. Um, again, you know, moving a little quicker, think about program and workflow management. How do you really keep track of your operators and the missions and the authorization process and log files and all that? Think about data dissemination. How do you not only push data to the end user for a given mission, but how do your end users also kind of go back into kind of your overall repository and find information that they want over time? And ultimately, analysis. How do you begin to kind of take a lot of the fantastic analysis tools that are already out there and really kind of integrate them more completely with the entire kind of uh, data chain. So really kind of a huge uh, aspect and huge focus of ours right there. Talk very briefly uh, about also our fleet itself. We are uh, expanding our fleet, but again, even our fleet selection has really been through uh, the evaluation of our use cases and kind of evaluating the alternatives out there. Um, we are very kind of, you know, DJI-centric uh, to begin with. Uh, we have, again, five Phantom 4s, some Inspire 2s, that Matrice 210 with both the Zoom and the IR. We have tried also a six-rotored unique aircraft and also have a number of fixed-wing drones, uh, especially for large uh, surveying of large areas. 
and we continue to expand our fleet beyond this. We've actually very recently purchased a number of those DJI Mavics um, that are really kind of fantastic, you know, really relatively inexpensive drones, and we're also looking at other specialized drones, particularly ones uh, suitable in all weather for emergency response. So really kind of begin to kind of expand our fleet and our overall capabilities. You show at least one example that shows how we're kind of actively learning from all of our missions. These kind of images uh, show how we documented the progress of a very high profile bridge replacement in downtown Boston last summer. We flew a number of missions over about a three week period. You know, in this case, kind of the you know, end result was really that the highway administrator was able to kind of you know, use some of the images and social media to kind of get word out to the public, given how disruptive, frankly, you know, this bridge, uh, uh, this bridge replacement was, and really kind of provide kind of more insight into what was going on. But again, in the same way, we really kind of use this to identify needs across coordination, data upload, sharing, and analysis, so that we kind of constantly, you know, feeding back upon our processes, our kind of operational approach or con concepts of operation, in order to better expand our capability. And in the same way, we're really kind of growing that capability to support multimodal needs across MassDOT and the Commonwealth. Everything from aeronautics, where we have a strong focus on airports, so looking at runways, taxiways, obstruction analysis. Rail and transit, that's kind of a, a, an area where we're kind of doing a lot of kind of investigation right now, thinking about how we can use drones to not only inspect uh, rail kind of outside, but also imagining how we could use it for tunnel inspections, looking at the third rail. And particularly for the highway division here in MassDOT, everything our pavement inspection, you know, uh, uh, looking at bridge inspection, environmental inspection, construction site monitoring, and others. And in this way, we're really trying to address the multimodal needs across MassDOT and the MBTA. But not only that, really also becoming a shared service across other Commonwealth agencies so that other agencies across the Massachusetts government are really kind of looking to us to kind of fly, uh, fly drones and look at more complex missions. So in this manner, really began to use this overall comprehensive approach to kind of support our capabilities, grow our capabilities, and expand uh, ourselves across both uh, the state geographically as well as kind of the types of missions we are doing. And again, I have a, you know, very uh, snapshots of a number of recent missions on this slide. Now, that kind of describes kind of the overall comprehensive approach, how we begin to kind of develop our overall drone program. At this point, I'll turn it back to Dr. DiCarlo, who can talk about more specifics about how we're looking at using drones for incident response and emergency management. Thank you, Scott. I really appreciate it. So from the incident uh, response and emergency management capability, the way we started thinking about it were through technology and capabilities, personnel, and partnerships. On the technical side, we were looking at um, the idea of flying all weather. We have the 210 that we have uh, has some limited all weather capability. We're also looking now at the Ariane Sky Ranger. Uh, we also have a concern from a security standpoint about DJI. So we're really looking at the requirements and looking forward to potentially doing an assessment of whether DJI works for us across all our different use cases. Uh, we use thermal imagery. We have secure live streaming capability uh, as shown in that go box that's on the lower left panel there, um, and it's, it's been working very, very well for us. Uh, we have 24-7 personnel. We, um, you know, for transportation incidents, we actually have a couple different operations and emergency operations centers that we use, and then when we scale up to a, a more statewide emergency, we use the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency, MEMA, and we work out of there. From there, we're the lead uh, coordinating agency for air operations. Uh, a lot of our US, UAS operators uh, have experience as first responders, and our partnerships are really strong. We often work with the state police uh, out there as well as with the NTSB. So I, I think really the um, emergency management first responder experience does help us. As far as deploying the resources uh, for emergency response documentation, um, you know, we do, you know, we work the aircraft accidents, including supporting the NTSB's investigation uh, with imagery. Uh, 
folks on the line here might really have heard the, about the pipeline fires. It was on the national news. We had a couple of towns in northern Massachusetts that had uh, simultaneous gas explosions up in Lawrence and Anover. So we actually, the NTSB was actually sent out on that because the transportation of gas is, uh, you know, part of their purview. And we actually worked hand in hand with them as a team doing leapfrog type of uh, drone, uh, drone operations with them. So that worked extremely well. We uh, do a lot of exercises, both within the inter, you know, interagency exercises, as well as with FEMA on some uh, more regional type exercises. And um, we're working right now with FEMA and MIT Lincoln Labs to develop a um, manned and unmanned air operations across state lines capability, including thinking about real-time dynamic, uh, real-world, real-time deployment and deconfliction of air assets. There's um, a software we're experimenting with called NICS, the National Incident Command System, developed by MIT Lincoln Labs. So we're looking at trying to figure out a way to have good situational awareness so we can provide good support. So uh, on, the on the innovation front, uh, our UAS efforts are really focused on integration. We are the lead uh, for the Commonwealth UAS Integration Program, a program that we created and supported by the governor. We are developing an ecosystem that uh, supports unmanned and autonomous vehicle economic development uh, and a safe and secure integration frameworks across transportation modes and domains both from a systems of systems and, and a family of systems perspective. Uh, near and dear to all of us is creating opportunities uh, for STEM programs and workforce development, including for kids from disadvantaged family situations. So we have a real interest in supporting that. The way we actually think about what we're trying to do on the innovation side is through this model. So we actually think about it from the standpoint of government industry and academia teaming with venture capital and innovation organizations to advance the state of the art. You know, we're really fortunate uh, being up here by the Cambridge Innovation Cluster to have federal and DOT organizations, including DIU, the Defense Innovation Unit, and the Air Force AFWorks effort with Techstars. So we're really, really leveraging that, as well as, you know, uh, our universities, our uh, research organizations, and the like. For facilities for actually doing uh, test and operational development with a focus on operational de deployment. If we start at, you know, the one area on, on the right center uh, titled MIT, that's the Boston area, uh, we think about everything that we do in a graduated way. So as we move away from Boston, we actually increase the, uh, the ability to do more robust programs. Within Boston, we're, we're uh, developing a capability to do, you know, with some small netted facilities um, and some areas that we can do some uh, drone training and then ultimately support urban air mobility. So we're actually working with innovators in that regard. If we move down to the right, the old Weymouth Naval Air Station we use as a test and training area. And then down to the far right lower, we are one of the original test sites um, with New Air in New York. Uh, that was uh, was one back in 2013. So we actually do a lot of work there. We have uh, restricted airspace as well as open airspace down there to do a bunch of what the work that we do. Um, getting back to where Boston was north of Boston is the Costas Research Institute, which actually has a, um, and it's a Northeastern University facility. They have a wonderful anechoic chamber there that they just fitted out that opens up into a huge netted facility that is, um, you know, we've, we have the DOD there, the federal government, state government, and local governments there. Moving a little bit to the west, we're working with Raytheon on a new radar that, they ha that has the ability to do some things like pick up low, uh, small radar cross-section targets. Uh, it helps us with the beyond visual line of sight capability we want to develop to um, uh, allow us our capability as well as for counter UAS. We're also working with UMass on the radar side as well as air traffic management. Uh, the actual projects we're doing, we're doing some uh, down to the bottom right, uh, medical delivery prototype, uh, we're building that out, working with MIT Lincoln Labs and a bunch of industry partners for overwater uh, delivery between the Wampanoag tribe on Cape Cod right out to Martha's Vineyard. 
We're actually supporting integrated UAM, like I mentioned, beyond visual line of sight, and we're actually uh, leading the counter UAS testing and development for the Commonwealth. On the counter UAS side, uh, it's currently focused on enhancing shared situational awareness capabilities by bringing together silos of activity and ensuring communication coordination and the leveraging of resources, including command and control con ops. So overall, in summary, we've developed a comprehensive program by building a strong data-driven foundation that can scale. That's really important to us, and it's you know, focused on transportation, transportation applications in support of our other state agencies. We're working hard on integrated UAS operations for incident response and emergency management, and we're leveraging the Cambridge Innovation Cluster to develop a supportive unmanned and autonomous systems ecosystem. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you so much, um, Scott and Jeff. Um, it looks like we have a bunch of people typing at once <laughs> at the moment. Um, I think, from what I can tell, Dwayne has kind of kept up with questions that were coming in at him about some of the software he's used and other things. But Dwayne, um, is there anything else you want to, since you got so many questions about that, maybe you could just verbally answer them in a sort of summary so everyone has the benefit and doesn't have to read through too closely? I'm busy typing right now. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. No, I just put you on the spot. Okay. Um, uh, all right, I'll, uh, go ahead. Um, yeah, so so I'll, I'll um, throw a question back to, to you, Mascot. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, building your, your technical resources in your, among your staff? Um, you know, obviously you've got everything from needing pilots to needing folks who are really good with data analytics. Is that something that you've sort of added on to existing staff as you build their, their skill sets, or have you had to recruit new skill sets as you built this program? What, what's that look like for you? Yeah, so we've been, you know, we've been fortunate, but I, I, I have to say we've done some advertisement for folks, but every person that we've met is through a personal relationship. Every one on our team is through someone else on our team. And it's really interesting because it's really very difficult to find the type of folks that, you know, you want to bring into, you know, your organization and your culture and to find people with the capabilities. And in some cases, our team, you know, there are a lot of real innovators, and um, they're looking for the right mix of folks to work with. And I, we, ha we have not been successful with advertising for any of our, our, um, our personal, personnel resources and, and our technical, you know, the technical capabilities they bring with it. And, and this is Scott. I'll add that I guess, you know, we kind of have as a two main um, groups of people we've managed to bring on board. Certainly one are the you know, people with real manned aircraft experience. And that I think is extraordinarily valuable as a part of the kind of core for your drone program just because although yes, flying a drone itself is fairly simple, right? Anyone go to Costco, buy one and kind of get it into the air. But the real key of operating it safely is try to understand what airspace is, understand how to operate within the airspace kind of do that pre-flight planning, uh, emergency response, how to deal with incidents. And that manned background really does give you a lot of the experience and kind of intuition to deal with a lot of those issues. And so, you know, between, you know, uh, uh, you know Jeff, who, was both, who flew both for the airlines as well as military, as well as many other members of our team who have also flown both for commercially and for the military, that's been key. And the other side is really also the kind of uh, people with background in uh, incident response or first responders. So we have a number of people that actually come from uh, firefighting units or kind of you know, EMTs that also bring you know, a wealth of just kind of pure drone experience, but also kind of understand how to work within kind of those kind of high stress environments. And so that's also been particularly valuable as we kind of look to ourselves as not just flying for those purely those kind of simple construction site missions, but really kind of, you know, taking on those more complex missions that involve, you know, many stakeholders on the ground of a particularly stressful situation. So I think having, you know, those two groups of uh, people have really kind of helped us grow. And, and again, we're continuing to grow. I mean, I think it probably we only have maybe about six pilots at the moment and are looking to kind of continue to expand. Great, that's a good segue into this question from Kamal Suleiman. Um, 
who says, can you give an example of incident management of an incident management mission and what are the triggers for flying on one of those missions? To to both of you, I suppose, both both states. Matt, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so um, so we, we developed a call-out mechanism, and our program manager, uh, Terrence McKenna, he's in the room with us as well here, uh, did a lot of work on that. But, uh, for instance, it can vary. Like, so we have a highway operations center and uh, for the, the highway division and operations control center for the MBTA. And they actually have, it's, it's really a complex wire diagram to where what mission when does it rise to the you know level to where you use a drone, right? And so there's an actual kind of a, you know a diagram there, a decision diagram on actually how that would happen. Uh, very often, I'll be honest with you, you know we deal with we have an investigator and and uh, for any accidents or events across the Commonwealth, there's a telephone call to one of our main contacts. In he's actually our chief pilot, an accident investigator. Um, an inspector, he gets a telephone call, and then we actually just rally the troops. That's how it's been happening, whether it be for the pipeline fires, for aircraft accident investigations, supporting the, the Highway Operations Center. I would say probably more than 50% of the time it's a telephone call to, to our uh, lead investigator. And again, this is uh, Scott, I'll kind of you know, add on the very practical level, you, know, uh, you also just need to make sure you kind of can fly during those circumstances. So first off, we are really looking at kind of expanding our all-weather capability of drones that can handle either precipitation or higher winds. But it's also a matter of being, being allowed to fly. I see a lot of questions right now talking about, you know, authorizations and all that. You know, luckily, again, the, you know, the lead investigator that Jeff mentioned, um, you can have very close contacts with the FAA. There was one incident uh, last uh, March during one of the nor'easters that hit the northeast where it was a subway bus that was kind of stranded in rising floodwaters. Um, so not a life or limb situation, but still trying to want to understand what was the situation. You know, the, uh, uh, the investigator was able to actually kind of work with the National Guard to get out to the location, but at that point was able to call up the FAA because this is actually deep within the Boston Logan Airport, you know, uh, controlled airspace. He was able to kind of call up the FAA and get authorization to fly within a couple of minutes because it's an emergency. So also those are the sorts of, sorts of things that you really need to kind of uh, you be prepared for as you're kind of setting up this emergency capability. And, you know, and again, you know, certainly, uh, uh, you know, given you know, uh, Dwayne's background, I'm sure I have many, many similar kind of experiences, and how do you kind of get that authorization? Yeah, this is, this is Dwayne. Um, what we have in Delaware is uh, we have set up a call out through our fire board. So if you basically, if an emergency manager or somebody calls uh, either 911 or, or their, the PSAP 911 centers, they have a call out list uh, that they can call out uh, an individual in each county who access the lead and they can task them. And uh, we're moving more towards like a fire service does with their uh, special ops teams. Uh, they can just ping you, and then you can respond back if you're available to respond. But like Mass was saying, that typically what we do is somebody calls and says, hey, can you come out? Or I can, And a lot of times law enforcement will call and say, can we put you on standby? You know, we got barricades, something going, something going like that, and we'll, we'll say, yeah. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll make the calls to mainly my Delta folks because I know where most of them are at the time. So, yeah, there's, there's just a couple ways. And, you know, one thing, I, I do see a question there, and um, Dwayne, I don't know if you've run into this, maybe you can comment after I do, but there's, there was one question there about has the either state run into any issues flying over and streaming from fatalities uh, in accidents. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll mention it this way, we're very, very sensitive to that. So during the pipeline fires, we actually had a fatal um, incident, uh, two fatalities, and um, it was, uh, you know, within an hour from where the pipeline fires are. So our team and the NTSB deployed there. What we do is we actually get a real good feel what the accident site looks like, and we make a determination. Um, initially, we take, uh, we do not stream anything, um, and then we make a determination of whether it's appropriate. But that's a really, really good point, and we're very sensitive to it. And unfortunately, this year we had a few situations where 
where there were situations where it would have been a problem if we had done that. So good, great question. Yeah, this is Dwayne. Um, you know, same thing, we do not stream a, a fatal. Um, we've gone through some fatals um, and, you know, photographed the uh, evidence for uh, the crash recovery units. If you're going to do that, you have to expect that you will go to court. Um, I've been subpoenaed uh, once this year already, and one of my other flyers just got subpoenaed this week to go to court. And, uh, you know, we're working with our attorney generals to, you know, hopefully we don't have to actually show up, but uh, the state has subpoenaed us to uh, be a witness. But uh, just one other thing, when you talk about uh, usually one of those, uh, if it's a FATO or some of those things, we uh, will take those pictures, we won't stream them, and we will put them on a thumb drive and hand carry them to uh, either the head investigator or our medical examiner's office. Great, thank you. So, um, yeah, I guess we, there were a number of questions about um, both sort of data, file sizes and data. Um, I know, Matt, that you detailed the MGHPCC facility, but um, for either, any of the speakers, is there anything else you want to add about, about that, some of the strategies, some of the challenges, um, any lessons learned from, from managing that data? Um. It's just a lot of data. It's not, you know, the videos are beautiful videos, nice, awesome, you know, but, you know, you've got to figure you're either going to have to either uh, drop box them or hand carry them. Uh, we haven't figured out a way to get around that yet. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has. Yeah, um, you know, the, there's a GIS expert that's been helping us that kind of gave us the phrase, if you can't find it, you don't have it. And so that really kind of, you know, guides us in trying to make sure that we are very careful in how we are not only saving things to make sure it is safe and secure, but it's indexable and it's recoverable. Um, you know, it's, you know, very easy to begin with just kind of be putting things in file folders. Um, but long term, when we think about how this is going to scale, we kind of appreciate that that is not a scalable solution in any way, which is why, again, we really kind of went toward this entire model of having kind of data almost at the core of what we're doing and really kind of working with these large kind of data, uh, data houses to kind of give us, a, give us a help. Certainly in practical terms for how we've been kind of expanding, we have been taking, you know, uh, you know crawl, walk, run sort of baby steps. I mean, initially we were actually just looking, using, you know, Google Drive and that sort of things that, you know, the, uh, we worked with the state to set up. Uh, that at least allowed us to have a baseline uh, repository and an ability to kind of, you know, share out of that. Although even then, depending on kind of the sensitivity of who we're working with, we would often, we often still will just save things to a thumb drive and hand carry it to someone. Um, but again, you know, that has kind of, that has given us the understanding and the insight that, that's needed in order to now expand to this MGHPCC data node and really see that, see this also as, you know, the next step up where we're going to kind of continue to both expand our uh, infrastructure, but expand our understanding to determine what we need to do after that. So uh, I, I guess the only thing I'd say is if you're really kind of just starting out or you're kind of early in the stages of planning a drone program, appreciate that the flying aircraft are as a small part of what you are doing. Really, you have a data program. And, you know, think about it that way, I think will help you down the, down the road. I, I could mention one other thing. So, and, and the reason data is so, so important for us, on the incident response side even, you know, data is extremely, extremely important. On the asset management and inspection side of the house that we do so much for the DOT and the MBTA, right, so what we're trying to do is to be ab actually be able to look at the deltas or differences of data from, you know, t between two different time periods of baseline data to the next time you inspect. Ultimately, we'd like to be able to detect changes using artificial intelligence that's built into software, 
So we'd have automatic change management detection, right? And then ultimately getting to the point where we can do predictive maintenance. That, that's really where we can really uh, uh, you know, have some additional savings on the whole process. But in order to do that, it's going to take some time. There's going to be a lot of uh, innovation that has to occur before then. And we're really just trying to figure it out. And um, it's, a, it's a difficult process. But we're, this is one of our major challenges we identified early. So we're, taking, we're making great strides, but it's a big problem. And let me also maybe add, particularly if there are people on the line that really don't have much experience with drones at all, about what we mean when we're talking about data. I mean, to some extent, I think everyone certainly imagines and knows, you know, drones can take single images, uh, can take video, but the real power is not just that eye in the sky, but it's the ability using commercially available tools in order to kind of turn that into uh, data sets that you can really begin to integrate with either your GIS tools, your CAD tools, or things like that. You can you know, take a, a single image, you take many images of a large construction site, for example, stitch them together into a, a mosaic file that is also orthorectified, so you can really kind of understand where every single point is you know, in a kind of a lat-long grid, and bring that into a GIS tool like ArcGIS or even just Google Earth. You can take measurements off of that, linear measurements of how long is a, a highway segment, area measurements, how much area did that contract, how many trees, there was the area of tree cutting that that contractor just did for you. You can even, using basically the very simple raw images, turn it into a three-dimensional point cloud that you can now take volumetric measurements off of. And so really kind of working closely with kind of our construction folks to understand how well can you uh, uh, measure the volume of a large pile of dirt that's about to be moved, for example? Or in one instance, we're actually building a uh, building in kind of around the Worcester area in Central Mass. There's a large ledge that was being blasted away to build the foundation. And through the drone flight, we were able to recompute that there's actually a much more area that needs to be blasted away than the, than uh, the initial estimates had assumed to you know, a delta, to a difference on the order of like several hundred thousand dollars. And so these are kind of different ways that we're not just using this kind of for some of the, like the PR pictures, although that is extremely important too, but you really do have very quantifiable data sets that can be brought into the existing tools that you're using that now actually kind of begin to turn this drone data into you know, either dollar signs, time saved, or you know, you know, uh, increased level of safety. So that's why it's really important. That's why we really are kind of going all in on uh, the ability of drones to kind of change how we're doing a lot of operations here. That's, that's really helpful, Scott. And that sort of um, leads me right into the last question that I had, which was, um, have you um, spent, in, it's, obviously you have spent some time and effort thinking about this, but um, sort of making the case for cost savings um, to your agency, has that been a part of your ability to, to grow your program? And what advice would you have for other agencies that are trying to make the case um, for more resources? How do you kind of package that? Yeah, so from, um, from the MassDOT perspective, from day one, we set up, um, a plan working with uh, one of our team members to analyze the business case. And so as part of the business case, there's, you know, a quantitative part of it and there's a qualitative part of it. You know, the quantitative part inclu includes return on investment. And we paid very, very sp uh, particular attention to it and we're tracking it. And, you know, it really helps when you have that ability to go up and say, you know what, we know we can improve safety. We know we can reduce the task time, improve the quality of data, and save money. And they say, well, how do you know that? And so we're able to, you know, literally do our best to give concrete examples. We're working hard to improve um, the discreteness of our capability to do that. So right now it's probably, you know, a you know, more rough order of magnitude as far as our, you know, building that business case. But it's been extremely beneficial for me when I'm actually briefing boards of directors or even just having a conversation with my boss, you know, to try to get the money to do these kinds of things. 
So uh, very, very good question. Great. Dwayne, do you have anything to add to that? Um, well, I can only give an example, but it, it, we're kind of mimicking the same thing. Um, for example, we, in our NASCAR flights uh, or our NASCAR events, we would actually uh, put an individual in a state police helicopter and fly around the the perimeter and looking at the uh, the traffic management and everything coming into the events and, and afterwards in particular. Uh, and you're talking, you know, that helicopter flies at $6,000 an hour. Um, whereas now we don't even put an individual in that helicopter. Uh, we can throw up drones, and you know that drone is you know two thousand dollars. You know that's just the purchase price. So uh, you know the cost savings, the uh, return on investment there is uh, astronomical, especially if you're flying for you know just two or three hours. And you're spending twelve thousand dollars, and you got a two thousand dollar drone. You can use the rest of the next couple of years. So just kind of a quick example. That's a great example. Thank you. Okay, and I don't see any other questions coming in, so um, I think we'll just um, wrap it up for today, a few minutes early. And I just want to, again, thank everyone for participating and your great questions. And, again, really um, thank you to the presenters. This is really excellent, um, and we, we look forward to building on this and, and moving forward, um, helping our, our members grow their programs. Thank you. Um, Jenna, this is Jenna, this is Joanna. Just a reminder that the